If I were to ask you tonight, why, why did Jesus come into the world? What would you say? I, I think some would say, well, he came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, the primary purpose of Jesus was not to come into the world and save us from hell. That's a fringe benefit, as amazing as it is. Why did he come into the world? Well, let's get it from him himself. John 17, okay, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God. And the only purpose that you and I exist is that we may know God. You see, we, we've stayed on the perimeter of all this stuff. We're here to be forgiven. We're here to have assurance. We're here for this, that, and the other. But the Word of God here says that we may know Thee, the only true God. I don't believe that five people out of every hundred who profess the name of Jesus know God. They know the Word of God. They don't know the God of the Word. John 12 and verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. You know that little word except is very, very interesting. It's a favorite word actually with John. Do you know he uses it no less than 13 times in his version of the gospel. Except a man be born again. Except ye eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Except we see his hands and his feet. It's except, except all the way through. Chapter 12 and verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, which had been dead, he was there, he raised from the dead. Verse 10 says, The chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. Why? Dear Lord, you think all the nation will be excited. Do you know, as soon as you're alive, you'll be a target for everybody to shoot at. They won't bother while you're dead, but as soon as you really get redeemed, filled with the Spirit of God, walk in purity, even your pastor will shoot at you. There's no such thing as being a Christian in a world like this without receiving opposition, criticism, bitterness, obstructions, misunderstanding, misrepresentation. It's a package deal. It's not a job for sissies. And this is angering the Jews every time Jesus goes down the street. Either they see Jesus, who is the Lord of life, or they see Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. And they're blazing mad about it. It's a reflection on their religion. They had formality, they had ri ri ritual, they had organization, they had systems of purity, but they did not have life. And Jesus is concerned that they might have life. Verse 23, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto accept a corn of wheat, fall into the ground, and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life for my sake shall find it. If any man serve me, let him follow me. You see, here's the whole essence of the Christian life. You know what those people out there in the world are doing? They're just crazy tonight. They want to live. They want to live. And they're dying to live where the true Christian is living to die. Makes all the difference in the world. You've got one grain of wheat falls into the ground to die. The first thing is separation. You have the wheat like that. You take one of those little, what do you call them, seeds off it, or grains. The first thing is separation. You know, when I, when I hear people say, I want to be like Jesus, I say, I, better doubt, I doubt it very much. Do you want to be torn away from your family? Jesus had to leave his father's glory. The hymn writer, was it? Isaac Watts said he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Right from the beginning, it was separation. You know, lots of people are all right. They go to Bible school or they go to church. But once they get out of that atmosphere, they go down like that. Because they have no inward relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They haven't learned to worship him in spirit and in truth. The first thing is separation from the main stock. And the next thing you have to bury it. Well, that's the part we don't like. Again, it's helpless. It, it can't fly away. 
It can't do anything but do whatever the master wants to do with it. And he puts it in the ground, in the dark, dirty ground, separate, lonely. And you know, that's the thing that's the biggest test for most people, being alone. But you never get anywhere unless you get to be alone. It's a paradox. We've got preachers all getting vacation. They need a cave. Get alone with God. Stay there. That's the cost, being alone. Pushed into the cold, in, into the dark. Moses, 40 years in the backside of that, he could never have made it from the royal palace with all its luxury, eating, drinking, dressing. He could have never made it from there through the wilderness. God had to cool him down for 40 years in the backside of the desert. And again, we shrink from loneliness. The Lord Jesus himself. You've got to lose everything you have to gain everything he has. Jesus left everything. You know, every great man that God used has had to walk alone, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It's a lonely business. Why are you fasting? They're feasting. Why are you lonely when they're in company? Why are you listening to God? They're listening to all the popular preaching of the day. But God's making you. He's not making them. He's making you. They have to hear God's voice and obey Him. My sheep hear my voice. And God won't say the same to you that he says to me, maybe. Except to be obedient and to be pure. But you see, this thing is kind of torture all the way through. First of all, you have a, the ear with all the 60, what did it say? You put one in the ground, you may get 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. There's nobody on God's earth knows what's in that man that comes to the altar. But I have to let go of everything, no strings attached. I'm not coming, Lord, so I might be a great soul winner. The first thing God requires of you is not that you're a missionary, not that you're a soul winner. The first thing he requires of you, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, which means you boot out every distraction, whatever it is. I had a man came to a church I pastored, he was a brilliant man in the British Navy. And you know how he lost his blessing, or lost his anointing? Stamp collecting. Just collecting stamps. Before he got fascinated with them, he'd go home from the Admiralty, which was in Bath at that time, get his Bible, he could read it in Greek. He was a marvellous speaker. But he got fascinated in stamps, he put all his money in stamps, and before long there was no anointing there at all. It looked very innocent. The devil doesn't always come as a roaring lion, he comes with deception. He knows your vulnerable spot better than you know it yourself. So anyhow, you get the, you take that one kernel off, you put it in the ground. Here it's 30-fold, there it's 60, there it's 100. You have nothing to do with it. Do you know what happens? It has a husk on it. Do you know what that husk does? It deteriorates and the stuff inside actually feeds on that husk and produces life, increases. Torn away from the rest of the family, kind of, put in the darkness. Left there in loneliness, in the cold, forgotten, ignored. You know, one way you can test your spirituality is how much you rejoice when you're ignored. When they leave you out, and you're eligible, you should be in it, but they leave you out. Boy, I rejoice in being ignored. I used to like to be, you know, front of the band and invited to big conferences. Now I couldn't care less about the whole thing. This thing has grown now, it's reproduced itself, say, that there are 60 or 80 or 100 of those little things on the store. Now what do you do? Well, you send it to a mill, it goes in a threshing machine, gets beaten up. And all the chaff comes off it, and you have a pure little kernel there. Then what do you do? You take it to another mill and make it into flour. Then what do you do? Well, you got that flour. And my mother used to get it, and you know, she used to knead the, the dough with her fingers. Now they are big machines. You know, she punched that stuff. If you see a machine in a factory where they make bread, boy, they have those big electric arms going, punching and driving and driving and driving. <coughs> it goes through that torture. And it comes out of a machine, it's cut off at length to go into a, 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 a tin. And out of the tin, you put it in an oven and you bake it. Boy, look at the things it goes through. How many of you have ever read, uh, do you still read Oswald Chambers? He has a recurring phrase in his re re writings. He says, Lord, make me broken bread and poured out wine. I think it was G.G. Watson who was preaching on holiness as a second work of grace. 
that God can do more than just save us, he can cleanse us, do more than cleanse us, he can fill us, more than fill us, he can anoint us. Well then we got the bread where we got it, dough, we got it in the oven. Oh mercy. Then you put it on machine and slice it. Boy, that's painful. Only one process more, that's this hungry rascal who comes in, gets it in his teeth and tears it apart. And... <laughs> that's the hard thing, isn't it, when somebody chews you up. You didn't really deserve it, but they do it. And it seems though the Lord's letting everything go against you. Why? For what reason? Isn't there a hymn that talks about he does this, thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine? But you see, it's when you're torn away from everything. We all want to lean. We sing leaning on the everlasting arms, but we lean on lots of other things beside that. Yet God is a jealous God. He wants me for himself. And the thing is that I get nowhere until he has total dominion over me, over my heart, over my mind, over my emotions, over my ambitions. We sing a hymn, all of its pleasures, pomp and its pride. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. The poorest man that ever walked the earth was the greatest man that ever walked the earth. And yet right from his birth, it was rejection, rejection, rejection. This is the carpenter's son. His family kicked him out. They said he was mad. The synagogue kicked him out. They tried to push him over the precipice, away there in, in Jerusalem. And yet he, got, he doesn't run to anyone except the father. It says that they went, where did they go? They went to sleep. He went as was his custom to pray. You see, my resources are not in my long years of preaching, not just in knowing the word of God. My resources are, uh, he is my resource. He is my strength. The Lord said to Abraham, didn't he, I am the son of the shield. Not I'll put a shield between you and your enemies, I am your shield. Well, dear Lord, if the omnipotent one is my shield, who can get through? No one except by his permission. Be willing to be a corn of wheat, to fall into the ground, to be forgotten and die. You see, we don't want to die. Lose your life, you'll find it. Keep it, you'll lose it. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. So if God puts you in a place, you're going to be forgotten for a year or two, stay there, be quiet. Be like the grain. It can't run away, it can't fly away, it can't say, I can't stay here, it's rotten. Again, people don't smell it because it's perfume, it doesn't. It's just as poor as anything you can imagine. And yet within it, there's something that when God touches it, life can flow out of it. Let me say this last You know, we take all that 15th chapter, and it, what does it say there? Ye shall ask what ye will. Who? Anybody? Did you just pluck in it? No, no, no. Who can ask what they will? The one that's been pruned. And remember again, it's the branch that bears the fruit that gets the knife. I don't know much about gardening. I don't want to. My dear Martha does the garden. It's beautiful. I know this, that when a branch is born a bunch of grapes, that branch never bears fruit again as long as it lives. You've got to cut it right back. And out of that little bud there, another branch comes. And we back off from the pruning, and all God wants to do is produce more in us. Do you know the greatest temptation to the average Christian, or every Christian? Come down from the cross and save yourself. Come down from the cross. Why do you live the way you live? He wants us fruitful in himself. And the only way to bear fruit upward is to bear root downward. And remember, he has the right, it's his right to do as he will with the seed that's his. And he wants us to be fruitful unto every good work.